Hello, hello, welcome back to another section of You Must Remember This by Joyce Carol Oates. Apologies if my voice is a little scratchy or if I sound a little stuffy, I have a bit of a cold. So what a perfect time to uh, get some reading done. Um, we are on chapter 13 of the section Shelter. I think it, there's either just one or two more sec like chapters in this section. Um, and then on to think the epilogue but anyway we're on page 393 i hope you've been enjoying this if you have give me a thumb and let's jump right in page 393 chapter 13 new year 1956 felix stevick was served a summons to appear downtown at police headquarters to be questioned by albany detectives and by a prosecutor from the state attorney general's office on the subject of Al Sansom and Sansom and Stevick. It seemed that Sansom had disappeared in Miami, Florida. He'd made arrangements to meet his wife Claudette in Kingston, Jamaica on December 28th, according to airline records. He flew out of Albany at noon on December 26th, arrived at LaGuardia that afternoon, stayed overnight in Manhattan, then flew out from LaGuardia to Miami the next morning, arrived in Miami, but failed to pick up his ticket for the flight to Jamaica which left that afternoon at 1 p.m. And after that, his whereabouts were said to be unknown. Felix told the detectives politely that he knew very little about his partner's private life, though he wasn't that surprised that Sansom was missing, if he really was missing, since the man had been behaving strangely for a long time, drinking a good deal, hinting at some action he planned, like packing up and leaving the country without notifying anyone, investing money, in reserves of money, he called it, in the Caribbean. Felix believed that Sansom had been under pressure recently, nursing some secret worry or grief. There were frequent dis disappearances, weekends mainly, but sometimes longer. He'd just disappear. Nobody knew where. He was a complex man, Felix said. You couldn't get close to him. He spoke of having secrets from everyone on earth, including his wife money in banks she didn't know of, places of residence in foreign countries. Felix spoke frankly and openly, but did express some surprise at their concern since his partner had not been missing for very long, hardly three weeks. Is this standard police procedure? He asked. I questioned Felix for several hours, then released him, then summoned him back the next day and questioned him again, this time in the presence of his lawyer. But Felix had nothing to add to his testimony. He knew very little of Al Sansom's private life, he said, and he didn't know anybody who did. Business was business. They'd had some disappointment with their resort hotel investment, but the 1956 season was expected to get them back into the black, and Felix knew of no one who might wish Al Sansom harm apart from Al Sansom himself. He's the Joker in the deck. <clears throat> Still, Felix said, he found it hard to believe that anything serious had really happened to Al. He had a feeling, he said, that Al would turn up soon. Said he'd telephone her, but he put it off for a week. Two weeks. Finally, he called from a payphone in a low hotel lobby in Philadelphia, asking, was she all right? And she said yes. And he asked her, was she feeling bad? And she said no. Why should she feel bad? In this small, thin, cold voice he hated. So he asked her, how was her health, her body, that sort of thing. He was embarrassed. And she said, did he mean she was, was she menstruating normally now? No, she wasn't, she said. But the pain was gone, she said. And there really wasn't anything to worry about or think about, was there? Now the pain was gone, the serious bleeding, the problem. Now the problem's gone, she said. And to this, Felix could not reply. He just stood there holding the receiver to his ear. And finally, Enid said, Felix, are you still there? And he said, sure, where else would I be? And she said, I thought maybe you'd hung up. And he said, why would I do that? A Saturday morning in February, leaving the Locust Street Athletic Club. He never went to Mazzioso's now. Felix happened to see Lyle Stevick up the block, peering in the window of a hardware store. A windy day, grit and snow flying, Lyle in his old frayed camel's hair top coat that came to his knees, a black fedora jaunty on his head. 
hands thrust deep in his pockets, and brow furrowed. While staring into the window for so long, Felix thought he must be aware of him. Felix close by, standing there waiting for him to call out a greeting. You know what? We should go drinking some night, get plastered some night, just us two. Got a lot of things to talk about accumulated over the years, going back to old Carl, don't we? Lyle had said once, and Felix had said, that's right. Felix turned away before Lyle could speak, if he meant to speak. His hair was damp from the shower. He was hatless and cold. Couldn't bring himself to shake his brother's hand. Not right now. Go off and have a drink with his brother? Not right now. Maybe he'd never see Lyle Stevick again. Alive. The survivor would see the other at the dead man's funeral. And that might be soon enough. Boy or girl? She'd asked to torment him. But it was a thought Felix didn't allow himself to think. A clump of flesh was all it would have been flushed down a toilet. That's what they that's what they did with these things, didn't they? Flush down a toilet by the nurse. It wouldn't have had any sex yet, Felix was certain. Wouldn't have been that far along, would it? Not that he knew or cared to look up the information in a medical book. He'd have to go to the library for that, and he wasn't going to make any special trip and in any case he really didn't want to know. The doctor had told Felix Stevick all Felix had wanted to know that night. The job was done, and that's it. Not a man of many words, no mention of fetus, embryo, baby, sex, only a quick run through of the medical procedure. A routine operation D and C, it's called. Sure, Felix had heard of that. Felix had heard, had had other girls after all, and his friends had girls. If you knew your way around and had a little cash, there was no problem. The abortion had cost Felix only $700, which he thought a bargain. Christ, he'd have paid $7,000, and Enid had imagined it cost much more, showing how uninformed she was, or how she exaggerated things. Neither the doctor nor the nurse had showed the slightest surprise at the difference in his and Enid's ages, which Felix appreciated. They were skilled, experienced, knew what they were doing, and did it. He'd never touch her again, he was thinking. He'd never see her again, except with other people around, and not for a long, long time, if that could be managed. I can't live without you, she'd said, wet-eyed and pleading. And Felix said, try. In the Mid-City Cafe, where he'd had a few too many drinks, Felix told a man he'd struck up a conversation with, that his younger sister had had a baby that died the week before, and he couldn't say why it hit him so hard, made him feel so rotten. A baby weighing only one pound. It was born premature, which is why it had died. Wasn't far enough along to live. Shook his head, baffled, saying, Christ, it hit him hard the way things go. Fucking lousy bad luck. And what can you do about it? Christ, there's just nothing to say, is there? And his drinking companion shook his head, too, and said, Yeah, I know. Or maybe it was the Genesee Street Tavern in the splotched mirror behind the shelves of bottles, his splotched reflection floating like a freak show embryo in formaldehyde. Felix watched the last two rounds of the Gillette Friday Night Fight. Joey Maxim matched with a black light heavyweight out of Cleveland. Walking away with a decision, and the crowd booed, and sure, the fight was fixed. Maxim was one of the mob's boys, and everyone knew it. But he didn't want to talk about the fucking fight. He wanted to talk to this man, Conroy, or Connor, an older guy in the neighborhood. Sympathetic, and a good listener, maybe 60 years old. And Felix found himself suddenly confiding in him things he hadn't known he had to confide. Drunk or sober. This baby that had died, his sister's baby just last week, and how broken up the family was. They'd never get over it. Conroy listened, saying yes, he understood. The exact identical thing had happened to him and his wife a long time ago, maybe 30 years ago. A tiny little girl, born three months premature with a defective heart, so she couldn't get enough oxygen. Poor thing. One of those blue babies you read about. The doctors put her on a respirator, but she didn't make it. Died in 48 hours. She weighed about a pound, too. Conroy said 
You can't imagine a baby that tiny speaking in a slow, serious voice, laying his hand on Felix's arm the way he guessed his father might have, but never maybe did. The sad thing was his wife never even got to see the baby, Conroy said, like it wasn't even her baby. She'd been carrying those months. The hospital policy didn't allow it. She was screaming. She wanted to see it, wanted to hold it, but they didn't let her, so she got sort of crazy for a while after that. But in the end, after a while, you get over it. You think maybe you won't get over it, but you always do. You have other kids, you know? That's the only way. Claudette was saying in her husky, hurt voice, so soft he could barely hear, It's some other woman, isn't it? And Felix said, No. Thinking of how he wanted to be in motion, in his car, in motion, taking solace from speed, from the phenomenon of moving rapidly forward in space simultaneously with moving forward in time, all his concentration, his very soul, fierce and reduced to what was immediately in front of him, that rushing pavement bounded by a blurred and insignificant world, and he'd have a bottle close beside him, not giving a fuck if one of the state troopers picked him out. He'd have a fresh pack of camels, smelling his old kid's pride in the car, this big-ass American car so finely tuned and expensive, knocking your eye out a black Continental with the look of a sporty hearse that did, in fact, remind him now and then when the bourbon spread warmly through his veins of the old man's casket at the funeral parlor on Prudhoe, the fancy white satin buttoned-in cushions like weird puckered mouths. Felix heard the hurt in the woman's voice, the peal, the anger. Claudette loved him, was crazy about him, and he knew it. And why didn't it seem to matter? Why couldn't she now even make him hard as he'd always been so easily, aroused within seconds? And in her angry desperation, she was behaving like a hooker, moistening her hand with spit to stroke him, sucking at him with her lovely satiny lips and mouth. It was like trying to coax life into something basically dead, Felix thought almost in pity for her, like prayer, during the same anxious movements again and again, when you know it isn't going to work, but you keep doing it, because there's nothing else to do. It's some other woman, isn't it? Claudette said in her hurt, helpless voice. You're in love with some other woman, aren't you? Why don't you tell me? We have to be honest with each other, Felix. And Felix's reply would be, why? But he said nothing, so empty so exhausted, so guilty, he tried to love this woman, who was better than he or Al deserved, but he'd failed, and he didn't want to make love to her. He didn't know when he would want to make love to her. It wasn't just that the sensation wasn't there, nerve endings dumb or numb or dead. He'd been drinking much of the day and the day before, knowing he'd be called upon to make love to a dead man's wife, and he might not be able to do it, and he didn't want the woman to make love to him, so he stroked her head. He gripped her neck, bunched her shiny hair in his fingers. Jesus, honey, he said, just let it go. Let me go. It isn't worth all this. <clears throat> Another time, she slapped him hard on the face, screamed she hated him. She blamed him for everything. What kind of hell did he think it was? not knowing if she was a man's wife or his widow. But Felix backed away, hands raised, not wanting to strike out by instinct, letting her have it, knocking her across the room with one punch. Jesus, he wouldn't want to break her jaw or her nose. He wasn't the kind of man who hits a woman. But how could she tempt him? How could she blame him for what had happened to her asshole husband? Claudette's face was savage beneath its elaborate makeup eyes wetly crazily fixed on him in terror of what he might do but he knew to do nothing just take it easy honey he was saying don't push it since al sansom's disappearance claudette had begun taking second all at night drinking gin during the day talking now of committing herself voluntarily to a hospital in albany small private hospital someone recommended 
It was 10 weeks and she couldn't take the strain much longer, not knowing if he was dead or alive. Was she a wife? Was she a widow? Every time the telephone rang, her heart stopped. In a knock at the door, or even a noise outside, her nerves were gone, and she hated Felix for not giving a damn for her, not having time for her. All she'd gone through, Jesus Christ, didn't he have one ounce of human pity? Felix said again, just take it easy. Not that he minded her hitting him, at least not in private. The quick blow surprised him, stung like hell, brought tears to his eyes. Waking him up, clearing his head, as if he'd sniffed ammonia and he liked the feeling, to a degree. Even felt a tinge of excitement, sexual desire. Claudette Samson, a woman he, woman he hadn't met before, and fucking her would be a way of really clearing his head, emptying out his skull. He loved the adrenaline rush, but no, he wasn't going to touch her. He felt sorry for her. She was damned better than he or Al deserved, and seeing the look on his face, she began to cry. Let him hold her. Okay, okay, he said. He'd see if he could find out for certain. Knowing he never would. Wouldn't even ask. Driving the throughway, snow swept and deserted at 2 a.m., the excitement was still with him. Heartbeat quickened and a little erratic, but now he knew he was safe alone, and in his car, lighting up a cigarette, inhaling luxuriously, thinking maybe he'd finally had it with Claudette Sanson, slapping him across the face, then wanting to be loved, that look of drowning in her eyes. Sure, she'd have money when it was all settled, but Felix didn't need that kind of money. How the hell was he to blame for anything that might have happened to Al Sansom in Florida, or wherever it had happened? For all the police knew, Sansom had been killed up north, and another man had flown down to Miami using his plane ticket. That was a trick that nearly always worked. Though Felix didn't know and didn't want to know. Without the body, who did know? He'd spoken with Vince only once since December, but the subject of Al Sansom had not come up. Vince called to ask whether Felix would like to join them in a deal bringing that Olympic heavyweight Floyd Patterson to the armory. 20-year-old black kid, just turned pro and hot as a pistol, and they could match him, let's say, with Joy Maxim, moving up. Maybe old Archie Moore, who was a bill that would sell tickets. But Felix heard himself say, no thanks, he wasn't interested, wasn't going to sink any more of his money in boxing. This must have shocked Vince, because the line was quiet. Then Vince said, I miss you, Felix. And Felix wasn't about to say, I miss you too, Vince. But he wasn't about to say, just let it for go, for Christ's sake, let me go. How I got off the line, he couldn't remember. <laughs> Vince had been his only friend. Might as well face it. Now Vince was gone. There weren't any. And did he give a goddamn? He did not. And Enid was gone, his sweet little girl. He'd never be able to feel... He was just a kid himself again, telling himself those wild, fantastical dreams of what's ahead, what's all to come. Oh, sweet fucking Christ, what Felix Stevick would do when he got his chance. Driving west along the deserted throughway, the headlights of his car beaming out in the snow, fall slow falling snow, patches of ice, everything snow swept and clean looking like the Arctic. That was the place for him. The Arctic. Claudette cried too much these days. A woman has to be careful not to wear her face out, Al Sansom once said, and that was true. And Enid crying because she loved him and he'd harmed her, because she trusted him and he was a shit. The stained mattress he'd have to get rid of one of these days, but how do you get rid of something so big? The blood-soaked sanitary napkins she'd put in the bathroom waste basket, carefully wrapped in toilet paper, so maybe he wouldn't notice. Grim little smile she gave him at the end, as if trying to cheer him up. And recalling it, Felix pressed his foot down hard on the accelerator, eager to get back home or somewhere. On page 400, after the little stars at the top. 
avoided Lyle Stevick on the street that day and never telephoned them now, but one February afternoon, on his way to see one of his and Al Sansom's tax accountants, Felix cruised north on Lock Street, that bleak, derelict neighborhood, and at the corner of East Cadbro was his brother's store, which he hadn't seen in years. Not the shabbiest place on Lock Street, but sad enough. Stevick's bargain in unpainted furniture. Almost anything under the sun bought and sold. Two big black men were hauling a sofa in the front entrance while Lyle gave orders in his shirt sleeves in the cold, oblivious of Felix passing close behind him. Poor bastard. Coming down here six days a week trying to make a living out of other people's discarded crap. Degrading. But he'd chosen to do it, hadn't he? A long time ago. Accounted for that smart-ass tone of his defensive and jolly, hearty, eyeing the rest of the world with envy. His young half-brother with envy. Well, he'd envy him if he knew him, wouldn't he? Felix thought ironically. Sure. What he might do, Felix thought. Suddenly cheered, surprised, the SOB. So he'd never get over it. Die and leave Lyle his money. And Lyle Stevick would spend the rest of his life trying to figure out how Felix had salted away so much and what the fuck had been his secret. Hmm. But he wasn't going to die for a long time. Sold off some of his city property at a good profit and bought 15 acres fronting Lake, Lake Oriskany on the south side, including the ancient brown brick buildings of the old Huron Tanning Company, bankrupt and deserted for years. He went to Graham's gentleman's haberdashery to be fitted for his first custom-made suit. The tailor told him the latest style was double-breasted, moderate with lapels. He recommended a light wool flannel pinstripe in a bluish-gray material, and Felix said, sure, fine, how much? Hardly listening as the man quoted his price. Next, he bought new shoes, $65, at Florsheim's. Keep in mind, this is written in the 50s. That is not a cheap pair of shoes. Hmm. On Main Street. Then he went for a haircut at the barber's in the Onondaga Hotel lobby. Left the barber a $5 tip because he was feeling good. For some time now, he'd been shaving mornings without exactly looking at himself in the mirror. Now he regarded his image in the barber's mirrors with a mild curiosity, thinking, who's that? In a context of ordinary men, Felix always looked taller than he was and in better condition than he was, shoulders and arms still muscular, and that strong neck and the way he naturally carried himself, pushing forward a little on the balls of his feet. Instinct urged him forward off his heels, as they say. You're either going forward or retreating, and it's hard to defend yourself in reverse. Felix stared, fascinated at his own image, his own face, as the barber clipped and trimmed his hair. His cheekbones chiseled as if he had lost weight, and his skin sallow and oddly dented beneath the eyes, and of course, the pearly glinting scar tissue and the big snaky scar, and he realized that no one ever looked at him without thinking, what the hell happened to him? He'd been carrying the mark of his humiliation with him these many years, he had the steely, concentrated look of an athlete past his prime, guarding himself against being found out. Still, he tipped the barber generously. Is there any mystery like who you finally turn out to be? Felix wondered. Removed the bullets from both his guns, wrapped the guns carefully in newspaper, drove to the city dump to get rid of them. Had the canal been unfrozen, he would have tossed the package into it or the lake. Shithead, Felix told himself, amused. You're really coming apart, aren't you? Once Enid teased him, saying, What if he had an accident with one of his guns and shot himself? And Felix said, You'd like that, sweetie? And Enid said quickly, No, no, of course not, fixing him with that hurt look he loved. He never drove along East Clinton, though, or Nine Mile, avoided that part of town, and if he saw a group of teenagers on the sidewalk, particularly if he saw boys and girls walking together, he always looked away. Had he done it on purpose? Maybe. One evening, the telephone rang, and he decided to answer it instead of letting it ring, as he usually did, and it was Lizzie Stevick calling to say hello. Gay, breathy, chiding, flirtatious, saying she hadn't seen her Uncle Felix in a long time. Wasn't he going to come down and hear her sing at the Cloverleaf after all? 
Sure, said Felix. Tell me when. Felix despised the SOBs who ran the Cloverleaf, but he dropped by anyway to catch his niece's act on a busy Saturday night. Stood at the rear of the noisy, smoky room, nursing a drink, assessing Elizabeth Summers, who was husky-voiced and sultry, knowing how to move her body, her bare shoulders, her breasts, her ass. Jesus, he'd have hardly recognized Lizzie with her hair bleached, bone white, all that elaborate makeup. Marilyn Monroe with the baby doll glistening li lips. Dinah Shore in the voice inflections. Slow, sexy, breathless style. Felix joined in the enthusiastic applause, the isolated cheers, whistles at the end of Lizzie's heartfelt rendition of Stranger in Paradise, but didn't hang around to say hello. Didn't know if he was vaguely repulsed by what he'd seen and heard or just disoriented. In any case, Elizabeth Summers wasn't his type. In early March, it began. Hey, mister, how's about a good time? A girl called out to Felix as he was unlocking his car on Genesee Street, having some difficulty fitting the key in the lock, and Felix looked up, squinting to see a girl startlingly young, maybe 16 years old, cheaply stylish in a black leather coat, Fake fur-topped boots, a sequin-sprinkled pink chiffon scarf tied around her head. Mister, hey, how's about a good time? In a drunk, belligerent voice. And Felix said, okay, honey, how much? Looking her up and down. Twenty-five, she said. Her smile was smeared and wet, rubbery. He saw her frightened eyes and wondered if she could be out here alone at 1.30 a.m. Behind the railroad yards, or was her pimp close by, sitting warm and cozy in a parked car, having a smoke, waiting? Okay, said Felix, in an amiable, taunting voice. Where are you taking me? He was drunk, it might be said, but his reflexes were unimpaired. Earlier in the evening, he'd surprised himself, overcome by a spasm of vomiting, but it only lasted five minutes, and now he felt all right. He felt good. He felt like himself, more or less. Around the corner, said the girl meaning the Flanders Hotel, as it was called. It's five dollars extra for the room. She was losing her edge on him now, which Felix liked, getting a little uneasy, seeing something in his face that worried her. Felix approached her, smiling. No need to bother with any hotel. Get in the car, we'll do it in the car. Just suck me off, honey. Can you do that? For ten dollars. She blinked as if doubting she'd heard what she'd heard and said, I don't know, in a weak voice, her frightened eyes owlish inside the heavy black mascara that she had outlined her eyebrows in charcoal gray, weird color. A pretty face, though, fattish cheeks and baby fat under the chin, a pink valentine of a mouth. In the street light, Felix saw she was older than 16, a lot older. Inside the coat, she'd be busty, plump in the waist and hips. She couldn't have borne it, fucking her, having to smell her perfume. Uh, he couldn't have borne it. Yeah. Fucking her, having to smell her perfume and her hair and her face powder, all that. Come on, he said. Get in the car. Ten bucks or nothing. No, I don't know, the girl said, backing up, unsteady on her high heels. Sure, her pimp was sitting up the block watching them. Thought roused Felix to a sudden fury. Hilarity, too, though he couldn't have said why. He made no move to take hold of the girl. He spoke calmly and politely. Seeing the piggish small eyes going smaller with fear of him, though surely Felix Stevick looked good compared to her usual customers, this stretch of Genesee close by the truck docks and a half dozen taverns, patrons were rough, hard drinkers, unpredictable mainly dock workers, truckers, men from the machine shops at GM, Chrysler, Ingersoll Rand. It was an insult to Felix the girl should back off from him. Where's your pimp? Felix asked. Introduce me to your pimp. I don't have any pimp. God damn you. Who are you talking to? The girl said, edging away. But Felix saw where she was looking and took hold of her arm and walked her in that direction. Damn you, fuck you, fucker, son of a bitch. Her shrill, silly voice he ignored. The hilarity rose in him. 
and excitement that had to do with the late hour, the freezing air, the puffs of steam and breath around their mouths, and the powerful smell of the lake close by. If ice had a smell. Did ice have a smell? Like water. Something fresh and piercing, clearing his head, mixing in with the smells of rubber, diesel fuel, factory smoke. The girl began screaming at him, trying to pry his fingers open, slapping and kicking. But Felix heard a car motor turn over just ahead. There he was, no headlights, but the son of a bitch was going to take off, leaving his girl behind, thinking probably Felix was a cop, which explained, too, why the guy didn't pull a gun or a knife, why Felix was to have so little trouble kicking in the door window, opening the door, dragging the fucker out, and giving him the beating he deserved. A guy Felix's age, with a broad bohunk look to his cheekbones, skin pitted, sideburns, and an Elvis Presley pompadour smelling of hair oil, begging Felix not to hurt him, to let him go. He hadn't any strength in his legs. He was so terrified. Didn't even try to block, block Felix's blows, just whimpering and begging, gushing blood from his nose immediately, with no instinct to defend himself, shielding his face like a woman as Felix stood flat-footed, striking him methodically with punches that traveled no more than four or five inches, so tight, so economical. He felt the power radiate down from his shoulders into his chest, as he hadn't felt in a long time. The fucker. Pimp. Putting a girl out on the street to make a buck for him. Felix must have broken his nose with his first left. Blood spraying over both of them, and the girl hysterical, but keeping her distance. Farther up the street, some men were leaving a tavern, but they merely stood watching. They didn't intend to interfere. Felix was striking this man as he'd strike a heavy, a heavy weight. No, uh, excuse me, a heavy bed, bag. Timing and pacing himself, being sure to give the fucker a half dozen body blows, the ones that really count and don't leave much visible damage. Cracked a rib or two punches to the liver and the midriff to the heart, a solid right to the solar plexus, any one of them a knockout punch, but Felix had his man propped up against the side of the car where he couldn't fall, like being trapped in the ropes or in a corner. He'd never hit a man who was down, nobody refereeing, refereeing, butting his nose into Felix's business. Christ, it felt so good. That adrenaline rush and the power in his shoulders and chest and arms, no matter he was panting open-mouthed, badly winded, badly out of condition, and reckless with his hands. Why hadn't he at least put on his gloves? Reckless as a young kid, and maybe he'd fractured his right hand on the bastard's jaw. What then? He stepped back, let the bastard fall. The beating hadn't lasted more than two or three minutes, and Felix was shrewd enough to stop before something serious happened, before somebody was killed. That wasn't the point. He turned to ask the girl, did she need a ride anywhere? But she was gone. Little bitch. He'd done it for her. Still, he felt good. He felt like himself again, driving away in the Lincoln, high on adrenaline, and he wouldn't come down for a long time. Airy and floating and roused to perfect happiness, Though his heart was still kicking and thumping in his chest, and he was still breathing through his mouth, and his hands hurt like hell, scraped and raw, bleeding, or maybe it was the other guy's blood, Felix's new cashmere top coat splattered. His floor sheen shoes, too. Christ, his right hand hurt. He hoped to hell he hadn't injured it and couldn't imagine why he hadn't put on his gloves. Fur-lined leather gloves. They were lying on the seat beside him. Still... He felt good. He felt damn good. Nobody stopped him in his big, lovely car. He was taking the deserted streets at 40 miles an hour, 50 miles an hour, hardly slowing for stop signs or blinking red lights. It was one of those times when you know you can't be hurt. You know you're flying high. You're going to live forever. And Felix Stevens took a city boy's pleasure in the narrow, grubby streets of Southport or Scanny, the darkened row houses, tenements, vacant lots, St. Nicholas, Howard, Strick, Vandermeer, South Strub Boulevard, bringing him uptown, 
crossing railroad tracks at a speed that made the car buck, skidding along old trolley tracks half hidden in the shiny packed down snow. Then a bridge. Couldn't see the water. Caught a glimpse of the domed basilica of the Polish Catholic Church looking strange, ghostly. There was the canal house tavern he often patronized. Neon lights still on. Another tavern, Smitty's, on 4th Street. Then he was swinging out to Broad Street to the lakefront, where houses and cement silos and small mountains of snow-covered gravel looking like something on the moon. Boxcars, trucks, barges, freighters at the docks. Even by night, Felix's eye picked up details. He knew the city so well. Goodyear Tire Company, Quaker Cement, Atlas Storage, Fulton Sausage, Pittsburgh Paints, the dilapidated buildings of the old Huron Tanning Company, which Felix Stevick owned, and the scrubby acreage that went with them and was going to be worth hundreds of thousands of dollars someday. Miles away, factory smokestacks rimmed with flame sent up vast billowing clouds of smoke that gave a watercolor look to the sky, orangey-yellow, a pink cast like dawn, beauty to the gray-layered winter sky like cotton batting laced with flame, bleak and radiant simultaneously. And Felix, in a rush of gratitude, though his heartbeat was still erratic and his hands were sticky with blood, could have wept, seeing such beauty in all he'd been a witness to most of his life, thinking, oh Jesus, he was going to miss these opaque surfaces of a world he knew so well. It was like his skull turned inside out, all he loved out there. He was missing them even now, when he was still here, still alive. Never got back to Graham's for a final fitting, though they sent him a half dozen notices, even tried to telephone. The hell with his custom-made suit. Let his hair grow long and shaggy. Didn't shave sometimes for days. Nor did he drop by Sansom and Stevick any longer. Stevick, too, had a habit. Mail piling up in his mailbox downstairs, notices of special delivery letters, certified letters. Felix threw most of it away. The telephone ringing in his apartment threw him into a rage, so he kept the receiver off the hook. Got into the practice of making his own calls out of payphones or in hotel lobbies recalling how Al Sansom was always joking about his phone conversations being tapped, and it turned out he was right, and Al had been scared shitless about something happening to him. But something had happened all right, and Felix had had the audacity to tell the police about his partner's interest and even expertise in flying saucers. Maybe he'd made contact with them, been taken away in one? Felix, looking deadpan at his interrogators, who'd stared in turn at him for a long time, not knowing what to think. A smart-ass kind of thing to say, and Felix's lawyer stiffened, staring at the floor. But the moment passed. For all they knew, Al Sansom had made contact with creatures from another planet or dimension. Maybe his body wasn't just dumped somewhere north of Albany in the mountains or in the Florida Everglades to be discovered in another few months, and probably suicide would be named as the cause. There'd be a note somewhere. A safety deposit box. Why not think flying saucers just for now? Felix stubbing out his cigarette, smiling mildly, saying he'd be damned happy if that's what, what it, if that was what it was. Ursula was married as a as planned in a small private non denominational ceremony in Miami Beach to her retired stockbroker, whose name Felix made no effort to remember. His half-brother Dominic, father Dominic, died of a coronary thrombosis in Foxborough. Felix didn't attend the wedding or the funeral. Didn't, in fact, hear of them until afterwards. Aren't you happy for your mother, Felix? Aren't you grieving for your brother, Felix? A letter dated 11 March 1956 from Lyle Stevick typed the ribbon faint, some of the keys broken. Let's the two of us get together soon. Please, must talk to you. Try to telephone, but the damn line is always busy or nobody answers, and I'm hearing disturbing things about you around town. Not that I want to butt my nose in your business. 
You know me better than that. But I am worried, so please call me soon. After all, we're brothers. Had the same father, at least. That means something, doesn't it? Then, two dense pages, single-spaced, about Dominic's death, the wake, the funeral, the man's personal effects, at the rectory, and his meager, pathetic will. Felix skimmed it quickly, forgetting even as he read. No mention of Enid, so he threw the letter away or lost it amid the crap piling up in his apartment. Too late, Lyle. I don't give a shit. Began to avoid Niagara Square entirely. His classy apartment building, where if he entered the lobby at the wrong time of day, people stared at him. The doorman with his fixed smile, the superintendent calling him Mr. Stevick in a tone he didn't like. If he wasn't looking his best, or if he had a woman with him. His preference was for cheap hotels, rooming houses as they were called, nothing fancy like the Onondaga, the Sheridan, the Oriskany Arms, where people might know him, or say he'd driven out of town on one of his impulsive, excited, aimless drives. He'd spend the night in a roadside motel, sleeping fully clothed atop a bed, waking very late in the morning or past noon, his head ringed with pain from hours of gym work, jumping rope, shadow boxing, sparring with a partner he didn't know whose face he couldn't see clearly, and the guy was young, tough, wily, just slightly sneering, giving Felix Stevick a workout, showing him up with everybody looking on, and getting out of bed had to be plotted and rehearsed, how to get the leverage for his heavy torso, then his legs positioned under him, then to the bathroom if he made it. His body, not a boxer's body, body now, but an ordinary man's body, leaden with fatigue, its youth gone. He'd wake to find himself in Fulton, or Marietta, or Oconee, or Pendleton, or Spragville, or out in the country, nowhere he could figure out or guess, and it would require miles of driving, sober now, cautious, to discover which direction he wanted since he wasn't a man who asked questions. Not thinking of Enid or of the baby, now not thinking of anything, just feeling banged up and rotten. Two days beard, stubble on his cheeks and chin, with a strange silvery cast, eyes threaded with blood, and sometimes one of his eyes swollen and discolored, cuts on his face, his mouth, his knuckles raw and swollen too, and he rarely made the effort to remember exactly what had happened but had precipitated an exchange of words into an exchange of blows, barrooms, lavatories, parking lots, skirmishes that never lasted more than a minute or two before some guy's buddies broke them up. There was always a good reason why he risked getting killed or risked killing another man or men, just as there was always a name for the place he woke in the next day. By the wee, Traveler's Lodge, Spragville Motor Court, but he'd stopped caring about the details, knowing he wouldn't remember them anyway beyond the next time it happened. Bottom of the page, page 407. Sober, Felix told himself he'd never do it again. Never. Stop drinking and stop cold turkey. Maybe gave, give Dan Hickey a call saying, help me. He could get his body back into condition any time he wanted, couldn't he? Felix Stevick's body, always there, waiting to be claimed. When he had had his first drink of the day, which was likely to be the first nourishment of the day at 9 a.m. or 3 p.m., he'd feel that sense of slipping, sliding, solid earth was actually sand or bits of crumbly grit you couldn't get a decent footing on, a canvas you kept sliding on, so why resist? Why so much effort expended in resisting? Pack it in, Stevick. Go where the current takes you. There had been a punchy ex-heavyweight named Zabriski who hung around the gym years ago. Big, slow-moving, sweet-looking guy, always in a sweatshirt, always smiling, showing a space where his front teeth were missing. Good club fighter who had actually gone eight rounds with Jimmy Braddock one night in the armory, but his career had ended abruptly, and they said his brain was like a sieve. Tell Zabriski something and he seemed to be listening then five minutes later he couldn't remember 
Felix kept his distance from the poor son of a bitch, but now he was beginning to see the advantage of being punch drunk. Life got simplified, didn't it? Flat, like a playing card with no depth. So thin you couldn't measure it. Only one side up. Mid-March, Felix Stevick was detained overnight in the Oconee County Jail in Pendleton for being involved in a public disturbance involving six other men. A week later, he was arrested for reckless and impaired driving in the city speeding east on Grand, 65 miles an hour in a 30-mile zone. So he was fined, fined $500 and his license suspended for six months. Not that he gave a damn, told the judge right then that he'd drive his fucking car whenever he wanted. But a few days later, he did give it up, left it parked in the street, walked away. He'd had a near accident, a head-on collision, averted at the last moment when driving on a busy street. He seemed to be drifting, helpless as smoke, out of his body, his head awash with dreams, and only the frantic honking of other cars woke him. And another time, he came close to running down some Negro children playing in the street, his reflexes mysteriously slow, hitting the brake. The Lincoln skidded sideways for what must have been twenty feet, and he sat behind the wheel, cold sober, feeling detached, bemused, as if he'd lived through all this before and knew the outcome. That's it, Stevick. By this time, he was living a succession of days and nights, not clearly distinguished from one another except in terms of consciousness and unconsciousness, the state of being awake and the state of being asleep and one shifted imperceptibly into the other, and neither was more insignificant. Was more significant. He was never drunk by his own estimation, and he was never sober. He moved out of the Niagara Towers without notifying his landlord, without having paid his March rent, leaving nearly everything behind, took up residence in the Mohawk Hotel, a room for $35 a week, with a view of the waterfront near the wharves, warehouses, saloons. There was the Mid-City Cafe, where he sometimes played poker. There was the Second Street Bar and Grill. There was Richie's. There was the Falcon Tavern on South Main and the nameless diner adjacent to the Greyhound Terminal, where he had many of his meals when he was in the mood for eating. Once or twice, he made the rounds of the Genesee Street Taverns, even asked at the Flanders Hotel about the girl in the black leather coat, but they claimed not to know who he was talking about. He never ran into her again. Or her pimp he'd beaten the shit out of. Would they recognize each other? Felix wondered. There were large, burnt-out patches in his brain he never entered. Why? To what purpose? Charred shapes you stumbled upon in the jungle. Likely to be parts of human bodies, or human heads, or just tree limbs strangely blackened. Or the space in the brain you go when you're knocked out like nothing else on earth and the secret is it's sweet. But he never entered. He didn't know and didn't want to know. He'd gone through all that. He did meet up with Jojo Pearl's father, though, somewhere on the south side. Couldn't remember the man's name. Then, in a rush of sick feeling, remembered. Leroy. Leroy Pearl. Swinging into a barroom on crutches, cheery and belligerent his hair like quills slicked back from his low, fierce forehead, and his face fuller than Felix recalled, cheeks ruddy from the cold. He saw Felix, stared at him, blinked stupidly, trying to place him, and Felix's heart kicked, urging him to slip away. Christ, yes, he'd better get his coat and slip away, resisting the impulse to go up to Pearl to say, Do you know me? Do you have any business with me? He could see Jojo's young, unblemished face inside that older, coarser face pushing through. A few nights later, by accident, they met again, and this time Felix was sick drunk, vomiting his guts out in the lavatory at the Second Street Bar and Grill, a long, balmy, late winter day in a month he couldn't have named except suddenly it seemed people were walking around without coats, bareheaded and squinting up at the sun, smiling, and icicles were melting and heaped up filthy mounds of snow an unseasonal warm spell which depressed the hell out of him for some reason, so he needed an early stiff drink since he'd learned finally to adjust to winter. He'd understood what winter meant, and now there was a danger of an abrupt change, and Christ, he wasn't ready, and that night there was Leroy Pearl in the company of a big hook-nosed man 
wearing a soiled railroad cap backward on his head, both of them loud and pushy and feeling no pain, and Felix was bent over a filthy sink, soaking paper towels and cold water to press against his face, and the mistake was Felix's eyes locking with pearls in the mirror. He might have ducked away if he hadn't made that mistake, might have avoided everything, but their eyes locked, and this time Pearl knew who Felix was. This time Pearl was in control, leaning on his left crutch, gesturing with his right, and you could see the ropey arm muscles inside the slacker flesh, his eyes rolling wild and wet, mouth curling like a scar into a smile, and Felix was too weak to defend himself, his guts still sick and knees like water. <laughs> Excuse me. Pearl said, only you, I know you, advancing on him, but it seemed to take a very long time for the crutch to swing through the air. Felix was trying to shield his head, thinking he'd slip the first blow, then punch in over it, a solid right to the man's jaw. But the force of the blow astonished him so hard, the edge of the crutch striking his skull, a hardness he'd never have anticipated, and he fell against the sink, against one of the toilet stalls, and now his opponent stood over him in triumph, shouting in manic glee, striking any way he could. Felix's head, his arms, his chest, his groin, kicking him with the heel of his boot, half sobbing with the effort. I know you, I know you, Stevik, fucker, bastard, letting my boy die, now it's your turn. And Felix was bleeding from the mouth, couldn't defend himself. Now floating above his body, looking down at the spectacle, a man lying on a filthy tile floor being kicked by two rummies, kicked and hit with a clumsy flying crutch. He didn't feel any pain or much surprise. Hadn't he lived through all this before? A door opening slowly, and he'd slip through and escape.